have them bring up to me a little stand so that I can put my notes here. How many of you have ever read the book, Rut Rotter Revival? Probably never heard of it, right? By Albert Tozier, A.W. Tozier. And in this book, he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse, thank you very much, Dave. I appreciate that. Very good. Yeah. Bring that water when you get a chance. Tozier quotes Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, chapter 1, 5 through 8, where the Bible says the following, and it's really, really tremendous. On this side of the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain this law. The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. For 40 years they circled the mountain, going in circles. Has your life been like that, circling the mountain? And God's telling you now, it's time to move on. It's time for you to have a faith that will sustain you through these dark times that lie ahead. I gather all my goodies here, if you don't mind. (laughs) Without faith, read it with me, please. Without faith, possible, please God, because... How do you like that? Anyone who comes to him, he rewards. It's impossible to serve God without faith. I want to welcome you today to Cottonwood Church, especially those who were baptized or came by profession of faith. I think we probably are meeting sick here a little bit, you know, so many nights a week and people took a little break and I don't don't blame them. Turn to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Quickly. Daniel 12, verse 1. I have time, praise the Lord. Daniel chapter 12, and verse 1, I want to read you something that is very important. And I pray that you come out next Wednesday for our Bible study. The notebooks are here. I pray you come out. Hebrews chapter 12, I mean, uh, Daniel chapter 12. Verse 1 and 2. How many of you have your Bibles open? Say amen. 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 Okay. If you're new here and you're not used to my boisterous preaching, that's just me. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in what? In the book. What book? The book of life. The life of the Lamb. It's not my book. It's his book. I mean his book. The book of the life of the Lamb. Some to everlasting life. Thank you, brother. Very good. You're a good boy. And some to everlasting shame. Now turn to... Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 21, briefly. The reason I'm doing this, brothers and sisters, is that I want you to know we do not have much more time. I mean that. We do not have time to waste. We're at the end of this world. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21. If you have it there. 24, 21. What did I say? 21? 24, 21. I'm sorry. For there shall be great tribulation. Notice Jesus is talking and he validates the book of what? Daniel. All right. Stay with me. 
such has not been since the beginning of what? Of the world. Until this time, nor ever shall be imagined a time of trouble such as never was. We're there. Daniel says, Michael stands up. That's a close of probation. How much more time do we have going in circles? We don't have any. We don't have any. If you look seriously at what happened and is occurring even now in North Carolina and Florida, it's devastation. And you know what preachers are like we now? It's time to stand up. God's upset with America. Are you with me? He is upset with America. It's time to come back to God and worship him. And how do we do that? By keeping what day? Sunday. We keep Sabbath, but the whole world is going to come together under one umbrella. And my brothers and sisters, I pray that you know how late it is. I'm going to give you some uh, negative uh, comments first about faith. I was. <laughs> Let's try it again here. Walt, you have a minute? Down arrow. Down arrow. You know what that means to me? I don't know computer anyway. You know what that means? <laughs> I'm hitting down arrow and it's not going down. Well, I've got my notes, and you'll have the text in just a minute. It's impossible to please God. Sometimes we assume we are okay with God. How many of you believe that's true? I'm okay with God. I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't do that. And look at all the wonderful things I do, and the Bible says you're naked. Is that going to work? It isn't going to work. Well, oh, that's sweet, isn't it? All these lights. Oh, I will get them on mine and put them up. Oh, I'll put them on yours then. I can't believe it. I spent all this time with this thing. Hey, from now on, I'm just going to take the Bible and preach. Amen. 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 I want to preach the word to you. Forget all that stuff. Okay, faith is, real faith is not just something you say. You could say, I have faith. I believe in faith. I love the Lord. We assume we're okay. Before starting her new job in a correctional institute, I like a little humor, my daughter Rita had to cons- complete four weeks of self-defense and weapons training. She passed the self-defense requirement with ease, but her lack of prior experience with guns gave her problems. Her instructors, noting her good technical skill, were baffled that she couldn't hit the target. Now listen to this. After weeks of failure, Reader suddenly suddenly became aware of her problem. She finally concluded she was closing the wrong eye. (laughs) She assumed she was okay. I love this from Paul. If a man claims to have faith, number one, if a man claims to have faith, but no deeds, can such save him? No. A Gallup poll shows that 50 million Americans claim they're Christians but their lifestyle does not match their claim. They don't go to church. They don't pray pray at mealtimes. They don't have Bible study. In fact, one man said to me, I can love God without going to church. Uh Uh-huh. What does the Bible say in Hebrews 10? We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Would you say amen to that? We are to come to church. You know what bothered me about COVID? If you get offended with me, you'll get over it, won't you? All right. I, uh, 
I remember when COVID came, it divided Americans, and guess what? It divided the church between wearing and not wearing. You know, that didn't bother me. At that time, I was in Prescott Church. I led out in certain things. In fact, on, on Sabbath morning, at, at, uh, when the sermon was going on upstairs, Tony allowed me to preach downstairs without a mask. We had 40, 50 people there. And one of those people that really enjoyed what we were saying was a young deputy who was killed in Prescott. You remember him? Seventh-day Adventist boy. He said, oh, pastor, I love coming here. I love being with you. I hear the word of God. I don't have to wear this crazy thing. You know, the sad thing is that it split the church, didn't it? Guess what? Hey, the devil knows what works and what doesn't work. That's a pre preempt. If we can do it for a year and a half, oh, we can stop you from coming to church again. In fact, the government will step in. And what does the church say? I'm sorry about your liberties. We don't want people infected with COVID. I'm not going to downplay that. Many died. Oh. Many died all alone in the hospital because their children could not come to their bedside. You remember that? In nursing homes, look what happened in New York with the governor there. They kicked him out, didn't they? What happened? He gave access to the nursing homes, and they got sick and died. No son to say, I'm sorry, Mama. No daughter. They died alone. Ah, but not alone. Amen? Jesus was there. People come to church to be moved, to be inspired, to be stimulated. But just because you feel God's presence doesn't mean you have real faith. It's a quiver in the liver. You didn't catch that, did you? 1 John 3.17 tells us this. If anyone has material possessions, sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can he, how can the love of God be in him? Hmm. They're cold. Not just something you feel. You see a brother and sister in need. I put down here, sympathy says, I'm sorry you hurt. Empathy says... I hurt with you. Compassion says, I'll do anything to help you out. Have you ever seen people suffering along the side of the road with a little sign? And you say to yourself, oh no, here we go again. I give money to these people and I see them smoking or whatever. But I don't know the burden they're carrying. Do you? So faith is is not just something you feel. Number three, real faith is not something you think. Have you ever seen people, and I'm sure you have, listen to this, who want to debate their faith? It's a chance to debate an idea, to be discussed, a principle, to be bandied about. Well, we don't make any decision. It's a mental challenge. One man came to church one day when I was pastoring in Florida, and he said, "Um, tell me about your church. And we went around, and I was getting ready to preach, and I said, after 20 minutes of saying the same thing over and over, I don't have any time for you. I'm sorry, my brother. He just want to, wanted to bandy about. I don't know what that phrase means, but it sounds pretty interesting to me. <laughs> bandied about. I didn't say banded about. I said bandied about. Um, I recently memorized Psalm 32, 8, and here it is. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. That's God telling you, I will guide you with my eye. My eye is on you. You're the apple of my life. You're my apple. I love you. Say amen to that. You're the apple of my eye. 
Well, I said that to Christine when I first met her, but it didn't mean much because she was pretty independent. <laughs> Played basketball, you wouldn't believe all the things she did. Bought her own little Honda motorcycle, to which I quickly borrowed and hit the back of a car one day. <laughs> ba I bounced off the hood, and the man came around, and I'm like this. He came around, and he said, son, are you okay? I said, my headlights just turned on. <laughs> I'm all right. Oh, my. <laughs> Number four, real faith is not just something you believe. You believe that there is one God. Good. But even the demons believe that and shudder. Listen, to that. they shudder. You know that Satan is afraid of the second coming? Did you know that? Revelation 12, 12, he knoweth he hath but what? Short. Say it with me nice and loud. A short time. Oh, amen. We're going home to victory. Amen. Walk streets of gold. Live in, a, yeah, a palace. You know what I believe? I believe that Brian was right. God is going to take your gifts and your talents and your personality, and he's going to make a mansion fit for you and no other. He's going to give you a new name. I need a new name after Rocky, do you think? No, I like Rocky. <laughs> In the army when I joined, they said Rocky Marciano. I said, not that Rocky. <laughs> he was a boxer, by the way. Heavyweight champion. I met people who say, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. Well, the Bible says in, in, in Psalm 14 and verse 1, it says, a fool in his heart says there is no God. So if you believe in God, that doesn't mean you're a Christian, does it? Even the fool knows that. And believe me, Satan knows. Oh, my brothers and sisters, he's getting ready for the final attack. My leg has been killing me lately. You don't know that, but it has been bad. I, can, I thought it was all over this sciatica, but it's all come back. But you know something? I got so mad one day, I said, Lord, I'm cutting it off. And then I got to thinking, those who cut off lose their leg, they have what they call a ghost feeling. They feel it anyway. So I'll <laughs> let it go, right? Amen? <laughs> Amen. Let it go anyways, you know? <laughs> but God is with me, dear saints. I love you and he loved you. <laughs> now let me give you six principles that I want you to remember. They're the positive side of the negative. How's that sound? Positive side of the negative? All right, listen. Number one, faith is believing when you don't see it. Believing when you don't see it. Now listen to the scriptures. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It's not Seeing is believing. That's not faith. Faith is believing and seeing. Do you agree with that? Sometimes I wonder if we really believe that. Listen, believing is seeing. Oh, I believe that because I've seen God work miracles. Amen? I've prayed and God has worked miracles. This morning I was on the phone with a dear friend of Christine and mine, Diana Moore, and I prayed with her. She's in the hospital. Her heart isn't doing well. They thought she had cancer the lung. She doesn't. But she has heart problems. Do you have heart problems? Do you have heart problems? Hmm. Number two, faith is believing when I don't understand it. Not only believing when I don't see it, believing when I don't understand it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down a journey that I've had at this church. I'm not Pentecostal. I'm Pentecostal in preaching, but I'm not Pentecostal. But I want you to see something before I lose my suspenders here. <laughs> Listen to this now. Faith is believing 
when I don't see it. It's believing when I don't understand it. It was faith that made Abraham obey God when he called him to go out of the country. God had promised him he left his own country without knowing where he was going. Going, not knowing. When I went to Florida in 1985, the president there, Malcolm Gordon, said, Rocky, uh, we have three churches open. We moved down with the U-Haul truck, didn't we, honey? Parked it at Best Western. We've got three churches open. Have your pick. Ah, St. Petersburg, Florida has 500 members. They would love to have you come. Smyrna Beach has 180 to 200. And the University Church has 38. My wife said, we're going to go visit the University Church today. I don't want you seeing St. Petersburg. You'll probably take that church. So we went, didn't we, honey? And we sat in the back. And uh, Brother Long, that was his name, turned around and he said, we sure need you here, son. The preacher who was preaching, it was his last Sabbath. And do you know what that man said? He said, the Catholic Church has Mary, Pentecostalism has tongues, and we got Ellen White. I was so upset with this guy that when I got to the door, I didn't have a chance to say anything. He said to me, are you the preacher to replace me? I said, brother, I sure hope so. (laughs) He was a good man, but his words came to haunt him. We took that church of 38, and one and a half years, it had 220. Amen. That was God. My head elder was 23. All young people, and here I am in my 40s. Go figure, right? Faith is an action word. Believing when I don't see it, it's not seeing, it's believing in seeing. Let me give you a little illustration of this. When our daughter was a little girl, maybe 10 I cannot remember her name at the time. We were at my mom's home in New Hampshire. My brother had gone out the door. My brother was a car dealer. He wore a little ring on his finger, a little piggy. Oh, that was, I guess that was prestige. I, I sold cars. Well, he, he was very wealthy. He had a little diamond also, and he dropped it. He looked and looked, couldn't find it. It was a precious stone of some kind. I can't remember all the details, but he came in, and our daughter Jennifer said, I can find it. How are you going to find it? She went out, and a few minutes later, she came back in with it. <laughs> Believing is what? See. I believe when I, I don't see it. You know, another thing about Abraham, he took Isaac up the side of a mountain, didn't he? Is that believing you see? Let's suppose you were there and your teenage son you were taking to the mountain to offer to God when you thought it was just a spiritual offering. And God said, put him on the wood. Well, that's interesting. Isaac carried the wood, didn't he? Just like Jesus. He carried the wood. And then he willingly laid himself on the wood. Abraham was weeping, I know, so hard he couldn't take it. And I can picture Isaac saying, don't worry, Dad, don't worry, this is God's will. He reaches his knife up to slay his own son, and what happens? God says, don't you dare. I have provided a lamb. Caught in the thicket of this world, Jesus Christ is a lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Faith is giving when I don't have it. Ah, ah, ah. Now we're getting a little close. Great principle, you know. If I asked you to exchange your wallets with your neighbor today and then took up an offering, how would you feel? Well, it's not my money. Right? I did that one time. I didn't think I'd chance it today. Take your Bible, turn to Acts 3, just for a moment. The book of Acts, the Acts of God. Not just the acts of his people, but the acts of God. And by the way, this book will be repeated, Ellen White says, at the end of the world. 
the acts of God. You're going to do miracles you never dreamed of. Jesus said, I do these things and greater things you will do. Acts chapter 3. I want you to catch this. Acts chapter 3, verse 3 through 6. Here it is. Listen, this is so good. Here's a man. First, Peter and John are on their way to go to the temple for the hour of prayer at the ninth hour in the afternoon. They're going to go pray. Uh, But someone catches their attention. A certain man lame from his mother's womb. He was born crippled. Laid at the gate every day. No hope. No faith that anything would change. And then, listen to this. Peter and John were about to go into the temple. They asked for, into the temple. He saw them, and he asked for alms. Catch this right now. Peter fixes his eye on this crippled man, and he said what? Silver and gold. That's a prophecy. You're not going to have any money at the end of this world. Silver and gold I do not have, but such. I like the King James. So, what do you have? What do you have? I don't have any money, but such as I have, I will give to you. What do you have in that such? What is there in your life in that such as I have? I'll give it to you. Rise up and walk. Oh, man, how many people would shun at that? We're going to tell him to rise up and walk, John? Yes, Peter said. Rise up and walk. And the man stood up, jumping and praising God. Oh, my, we need more faith. We need more faith. Giving one I don't have it to help people. Giving yourself, you see. The oldest known viable seeds were found in 1954 in a lemming burrow in Canada's frigid Yukon. The frozen burrow, buried in silt and sediment, was 4,200 years old. The Arctic tundra lupine seeds were found with lemming remains, and when placed in favorable conditions, several seeds sprouted. Within 48 hours, one of the plants later bloomed. Has your life been dormant for so long because you've had so little faith, faith you really didn't believe without seeing? So now your seed is ready to to blossom. What do you say? Next, persisting when I don't feel like it. I don't want to go to church today. I don't want to go to church. I remember telling my father that when I was 15. I don't feel like going to church today. He said, what did you say? (laughs) What did you say? I said, Dad, I don't feel like going. I'm a teenager now. Oh. Oh. Well, I went. My mother was hanging clothes one day, and she said, please help me, Rocky. And here I am, a teenager. And I said, Mom, I don't feel like it. My dad was in the back room, and he heard. He came running out. He said, what would you say to your mother? I said, I really don't feel like it, Dad. Well, he said, let me give you some feeling. And I'm telling you, he took his belt off, and I sure felt that. Oh, yes. Faith is persisting when I don't feel like it. If you could erase all the failures or mistakes in your past, you would also erase all the wisdom of the future. Did you get that? If you could erase all your faults and all your failures and the things you learned from them, you would also erase all the wisdom God has for you in the future. Is that good? All right. Persisting when I don't feel like it. Faith is thanking God before I get it. By faith, the walls of... I didn't give you that text, by the way. It was by faith that Moses left Egypt, was not afraid of the king's anger. He held to his purpose like a man who could see the invisible. Oh, I love that. We can't see the invisible because we're still in time. But one day soon, very soon... God will unroll the canvas and the, and the earth will part like a scroll. Oh, what a God. Oh, what a God. Amen. Faith is thanking God before I get it. Am I up to nine now? 
Uh, I think I was. Faith is thanking God before I get it. Well, you've got to have faith to do that. Jesus walks to the tomb of Lazarus. You remember that story? How many of you know it? He's standing there, and what does he say to the, his followers? Roll away. Well, why didn't he roll it away? He could have just snapped his fingers and rolled it away. He said, you roll it away. I want to see your faith in action. Uh, you mean he's going to try to do something with Lazarus? Oh, my. Mary and Martha are watching. Bring him out. Bounding rave clothes. And he says here, I love it. You know the story. In John 11, he said, I thank you, Father, that you've heard me, but I say it so that others might believe. Come out, Lazarus. If Jesus had said, I'm going to ask you this now, everyone who is dead in their graves come forth, what would have happened? We would have had a resurrection. All the way back to the beginning. But he said, Lazarus, come forth. And they took his clothes off, and you know very well he had nothing to say about heaven, hell, or anything else. He was bound. But you know, when the bindings come off, you begin to see, don't you? Have you been bound in the tomb of your own making? That's a good point, isn't it? Have you? Oh, my. Thanking God before I get it. Thank the Lord before you even have it in your hands. Imagine your prayers if we really thank God before we have something. Think what, what do you want to thank him for? Let me ask you, what do you want to thank him for? What about your prayer life? When you have real faith, you live in a different realm of faith. Ah, but here's the real realm of faith. Number 10. Trusting God if I don't get it. Oh, yeah, I trust God even if I don't get it. How many times have you prayed and God said no, or at least hold it for a while? I have finished a series on prayer that I'm going to preach here, a six-part series, when God doesn't answer your prayers. Really interesting. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something what? Better. Oh, I love that. For God had far better things in mind for us that we should also benefit them, for they can't receive the prize at the end of the race until we finish the race. Our dead are not going to heaven. They're not going to be raised to go to heaven. Yes, Lazarus was raised. You know why? God is planning a party. And I'm telling you, when the plagues are poured out on this world and Jesus come forth, ye that have done the will of God, you will see tulips like tulips on a spring morning. Tombs will burst open. And mama will say, hi, boy, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing better now. See, I didn't know if I'd make it, but I'm doing better now. Queens, New York. A woman leaned out her eight-story tenement window and screamed for help. She was trapped in her bathroom. The inside knob had fallen off when her youngest child, age two, had closed the door from the other side. Two of her other children, ages four and five, were in the kitchen alone, supper cooking on the stove. The woman alternated between trying to break down the door herself and shouting to be heard. Meanwhile, a young man who lived 20 miles away happened to be visiting in the neighborhood that day. From the street below, he heard the women's plea. He waved his hand to catch her attention, and then she screamed out, to which he said, I'm coming up to help you. A short time later, she heard the voice from the other side of the bathroom door. Listen closely, the young man instructed. Put your fingers in the hole where the knob should be and pull it up. Lift the door slightly, then quickly pull it open. The woman followed the stranger's instructions, and within minutes, the door was open. Once freed from her temporary prison, in response, of course, the children all came hugging mom. 
When all three children were safe within view, the woman turned to the young man and asked in amazement, how could you possibly have known how to get into my apartment and how do you know how to open that door? I know very well, he answered with a smile, crossing his face. I was born here. I lived in this apartment for 15 years. Ah, I know how to get in the front door without a key, and the bathroom knob, it would always fall off, and we learned how to open the door the way I showed you. Jesus says, you don't know what you're doing. I've been here. I was born here. I was raised here, and you're not on your own. I will open the doors for you. Say amen. amen. In closing, God has something better. Hebrews chapter 11, often called the Hall of Faith. It enshrines men and women of faith who triumphed over their weaknesses in their lives. They all died not having received the promise, seeing the invisible future. They searched for a city whose ruler and builder was God. Number one, vision. They saw the promises afar off. They had power for today because they had vision for tomorrow. Number two, Confidence. They were assured of the promises. They believed them. Three, hunger. They embraced the promises. They had ownership of only what their descendants would enjoy. Pass it on to my children. Are you living like that? Do they know you have fit? They, in resolve, confessed their to stra- they were strangers and pilgrims. They made up their mind, their dreams, not their memories. Would follow them. Do you ever dream about God? Do you ever dream about going home like this tree bent on the side and, you know, all your failures? Remember again. We are a product of our past, but we are not, what? A prisoner of our past. You like that? Product, not a prisoner. I can change. You can change. How many of you like to change today? Raise your hand. God, I want you in my life. I'm willing to surrender everything and anything that separates us. I had put something in my Bible, you know, that I'm always writing down little things. These are some of the jewels that I write down when I'm, you know. When your attention is distracted, your understanding is distorted, and your vision is disrupted. Are you going to allow the devil to distract your attention? If you do, your understanding will be distorted, and your vision will be disrupted if you allow Satan to do that. Would you say with me right now? Jesus, Lord of my life, oh, how I love you. I want to serve you. And you said to me, I will never leave you, or what? That's what you said. There's a song, if you get a chance to hear it, by Grace Larson. Ah, yeah, I know it's connected with uh, Jimmy Swigert's church. Forget that. You got to see the song. I never promised. I never promised you'd have a life without pain. How many of you ever heard that song? Is that something? I never promised. God said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place, I'm coming back to what? Oh, my dear saints, God loves you. I love you, and I'm a human. I love you. If I love you, doesn't God love you more? Sure he does. Let's pray. Father God, oh, Father, how much we love you, our God. Our Father, I pray we will not allow the devil to divert our attention from you. We will fix our eyes on you, Father. And you, Jesus, oh, sweet, sweet Lord. You said you will ask the Holy Spirit to bring everything you have to us and to take our prayers and pass them through you to our Father in heaven. We thank you now for loving us. Oh, what a God thou art. Be with us today. We pray in Jesus' name. And the whole church said what? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Were you blessed being here today? Amen.